Thank you very much um, for, for coming to listen to what I've got to talk about. And um, there's essentially four parts to my presentation. Um, two parts consist of the research that I'm involved with. Um, another part of it is the problems that we are experiencing. And then finally, a possible solution to, to all this, and um, which I want to yeah, discuss with you. Okay, so um, where am I from? The country is South Africa, and um, I've made Africa bold over there because some people, they ask us, where is, in which continent is South Africa? So we tell them it's in Asia, situated between Russia and China. Um, institution of KwaZulu-Natal, and this over here at the bottom is the uh, pronunciation in Zulu. I'm not going to try that myself even. Um, we've got 11 official languages in South Africa. Um, I can only speak one. And um, essentially, the university has got about 20,000 students. Um, last time I remembered, probably about 5,000 staff members, mm. which is academic and support staff. And um, we've, yeah, we've got about five campuses that have all merged together under one institution. So um, the areas I specialize in is um, robotics. And if you've been to South Africa, this is known as a robot. So um, when I tell my friends I specialize in, in robots, they think I'm sitting in a, in a um, in the streets toggling switches for red, green and orange lights. Mm. So it's not the South African traffic lights. It's um, mechatronics engineering, um, looking at system integration where there's mechanical, electronic and computer engineering systems. All right, so um, the first section to my presentation is the search and rescue division that I'm heading. Um, and it's got to do with search and rescue robots. Um, over here are photos of me when I did my advanced firefighting training. And um, that was quite an experience of, of realizing the environments that the firefighters have to go into. If you look in this picture with that dense smoke, it's obviously a... Um, it's, it's not something you're really familiar with, you know. I mean, when things is a bit of smoke, it might be like the fire alarm come going off and you've burnt your food type of scenario. But it's actually so thick and so black that when you go for your training, you, they give you masks, they paint it black, and you've got to go into a building, you've got to locate victims, and um, that's all done by touch and sound. So um, the purpose for search and rescue robots, um, well, obviously to save people. And um, this could be victims that, have, that are in a building, or even your rescue personnel. The question always is, why should a rescue personnel go into an environment if there's nobody to save? Or if the victims in a building are possibly already dead, there's no purpose for them to go in and risk their lives. Um, also to decrease uh, the rescue time. It's, um, it's critical time, um, you know, you might have, to, might have a couple of minutes to do the rescue and um, you need to use your human resources as much as possible. So robots are quite useful to go to different areas where the rescue personnel are on and start in a search. And there's different scenarios. The collapsion of mines, which is quite typical in South Africa. Um, burning buildings, uh, collapsed buildings, like with the World Trade Center. Uh, explosions of industrial areas. So we've had, for example, massive fuel tanks, um, power stations, nuclear facilities happening in Japan. There's um, lethal area, um, areas such as um, um, with explosive gases. So maybe you might not know of this, but if some of the typical gases that you find in these type of scenarios, like carbon monoxide, when it becomes a certain concentration, it can ignite on its own. 
Um, so there's, you know, obviously you don't want to send uh, your, your rescue personnel into these environments if they're going to be an explosion. And then also something that might be, you know, something that you're not aware of is these gas bottles that they've got at the back of the trucks, if one of those had to maybe drop off the truck, they, um, you, you've got to, in theory, do a two kilometer radius evacuation because that bottle could explode. And um, let's be realistic, if something had to happen in this, in this room and you had to evacuate two kilometer radius, you might be able to evacuate your campus quite quickly, but there's quite a great distance ahead of that that you need to still evacuate, which becomes almost impossible. Right, so um, visibility is, is, is critical in, in these search and rescue environments. And um, just to give you an example, this is a fire that we've recorded with a normal camera and one with a thermal camera. And as you can see, with a normal camera, you can hardly see the flames. And with a the thermal camera, it's quite a big fire over there. Um, over here, we've got again the same type of scenario. In a normal camera, you're actually able to see some images. So, um, while with a the thermal camera, there's a bit of noise associated as well. So, you know, you, you're starting to, to realize that Yes, okay, the thermal camera is, is great to give some information, but your normal camera can also give you some information that might be quite critical. So, um, if there's a fire that's in, let's say, the room next door, that wall will start heating up, and um, this, <coughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know that it's heating up just by observing it, and um, it's, this is quite critical for your rescue personnel because then they know what to expect when they enter that building. Mm -hmm. So this um, image on the left is also one where we're able to detect heat coming through the wall. And then, um, okay, these images might not be too clear, <coughs> but um, there's, it's, it, you can detect your victims. So over there's a person lying, um, or trying to get up over there and a person lying down. Right, so um, victim communication is important. If this building had to collapse and um, you had a robot, whether it looks like a humanoid or even a tracked robot that had to come and approach you, the first thing you might think is aliens have just attacked us and this is one of the aliens that are approaching us. So, um, you know, you need to, there's a psychological aspect to it that also needs to be observed. And um, communication is important. You might be able to assist your victim um, because they might be just panicking and might be something small they could um, keep under control themselves. At the same time, um, you might be able to assist them to ev evacuate themselves instead of having the rescue personnel to go in. So um, this is a video that, um, of just a test we did with the Caesar robot. CESA robot stands for Contactable Arms Elevating Search and Rescue. Um, so yeah, how do you start the videos in the... It's a PDF, I think you can do yeah. it for yeah. yeah, you have to open it directly. Uh, okay. Um, Just to move the window? Yeah. Oh, okay, yes. Right. Um, let's see if I can find it. Here we go. Where's Lee? Do you have any injuries? Um, I think my left leg, but I'm okay otherwise. I think I can follow the robots. I should be fine. Okay. Okay, so um, we looked at a, a lot at communication improvements. Um, 
looking at frequency ranges and um, we want to increase the communication distance because this is quite critical. Um, often, you know, you send in a, in a robot, it might only go a few meters and then there's a loss of communication. And the reason for this is um, maybe the output power that's been transmitted is, is too low. Um, it could be that power is absorbed by the building rubble, especially if you look at your Wi-Fi frequencies or your gigahertz frequencies. Um, the wavelengths are, are the same dimension as the dust particles. So the dust particles absorb that energy and you can't get that distance of communication happening. So lower frequencies are better, but it's got its problems that it's got lower bandwidth and data rate exchanges. So there's obviously an aspect we had to look into there. We also looked into antenna types, um, orientation of the antenna. So if you've got one antenna that's pointing upwards and the one on the robot is, is horizontal, you're going to minimize your communication distance. So it basically comes down to the polarization of the, of the signal. So um, we had a look at um, antennas such as the egg beta antenna, which um, improved the communication um, um, a polarization, well, solved that problem though. Uh, so, um, movability of the Caesar robot, um, just to show you. The University of KwaZulu-Natal unveiled its first prototype of a search and rescue robot on Monday. The contractable arms elevating search and rescue robot, also known as CESAR, was developed by UKZN engineering lecturer Rian Stockforth for search and rescue purposes when it would be too dangerous for rescue personnel. The battery-powered CESAR robot weighs 50 kilograms and can sustain a weight of approximately 160 kilograms. It took Rian and his team three years to build the robot and at a cost of 300,000 Rand, it certainly doesn't come cheap. It's taken about three years to, to develop um, this, this robot as it is at the moment. Um, it's made mainly from Kevlar, which is what your um, bulletproof vests are made from. And it's, um, uh, that is for the body. It's got all of electronics and sensory systems inside it, and um, obviously some steel as well that has been used to develop for the arms and stuff. So basically it's bulletproof? I'm hoping it's bulletproof, yeah. <laughs> we also took a tour of the mechatronics department where we saw various other prototypes. UKZN master students in engineering, Chimela Onuka, also took some time in telling us about his autonomous sea craft, which is used for deep sea rescue. The boat can actually be remote controlled from the shore in order to rescue somebody in choppy waters. When is that that sea? The capability of this vessel is basically to assist um, the individual to actually get on board and uh, receive some assistance. Basically, um, one of our innovations is basically to create a kind of like um, an assistant ladder or a net whereby the victim will be able to climb up to the craft. As you can see down here, you see a net that is uh, basically um, attached to the boat. That will basically assist the victim to climb up to the boat. Right, so um, this is the Caesar 2.0. Um, it's the next version of the robot. So obviously the first robot did have some problems and um, 
we wanted to improve on that and so we got to this version of the robot and so far we've probably um, spent an estimation of about 50,000 Swiss francs um, on this project um, which is quite a lot for, for us considering that we usually have possibly about I would say about 800 Swiss francs for a specific project which is not much so matter of fact somebody has actually asked me is it possible to build a robot for that price we've um, looked at victim detection and um, so if you look at this, these images each block is supposed to be some part of a person and this is quite critical for search and rescue operations because um, you know if Bones collapsed, it might be only the person's hand sticking out, it might be only a foot sticking out. And so um, you need to be able to identify where the victims are. The thing is, though, is that if you look at these images, there's a lot of these blocks that are not people. And so it's not good enough. So we looked at um, different models, looking at different um, perspectives of the of, of, of the human body from um, the rear, front, left and right side view and um, we had a preliminary model that was well, it was able to detect more problems or more humans that there wasn't and therefore we got to eventually to a final model and if you look at the false detections it's decreased quite drastically from the generic model even um, so and this was something we, um, we mounted onto, a, uh, or the system onto a UAV, um, because one of the aspects that we were considering in South Africa is to use um, quadrotocopters to be able to go into the mining environments. And um, also the reason for, for having robots to go into the mining environments is that typical mining operation, in South, especially in South Africa, is what I've been told is you've got uh, a hole that's been blasted um, open and then I sent a person in to tap against the roof until they tap some loose rock that falls down but that's a person's life that is at risk so why can't a robot do this work instead of instead of human all right so um, we also are looking to unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs um, so over there I, I went for the training for the automation SR100 helicopter in the US and, um, and then also last year we built a steel rotocopter which um, was quite an interesting project in terms of the control aspects behind it. It's um, a bit more complex than your normal quad rotocopter. We're also looking into autonomous vehicles. Um, so we've got this Ford Ranger we want to make autonomous and we've built this control station um, on the back of it and essentially what we want to do is, is to have all our robots inside of it so that we can send out the vehicle to a specific location and deploy the different robots from there. Um, so that rotor motion helicopter you might see sticking out there at the back and um, people are able to then sit inside of that as well and, and um, yeah, send out your instructions from there. The thing with um, autonomous vehicles is that there's quite a few problems associated with them. Um, so if you're on the left lane and you want to take the off ramp that's on the right, um, as we've been in Europe, in South Africa, we drive on the opposite side of the road. If you've been to South Africa, you'll know about the minibus taxi drivers and um, these are people that won't give you a chance to change lanes so um, I mean it's all about money getting from point A to point B as quickly as possible so you know if it's an autonomous vehicle should it then slow down and allow you to come through onto the lane or should it go faster so there's a gap between your, yourself and the vehicle behind you for the vehicle to come across. So there's obviously algorithms and some networking that needs to be done for, for this to be a successful type of um, system. 
And um, there might be a possibility, possibility for an ad hoc network configuration. The problem is, is whose fault is it if there's an accident? If, um, you know, if you sit in an autonomous vehicle and you're a passenger and you're in an accident, is it your fault that, you know, and is it your insurance that's going to have to pay for the accident? Or is it the manufacturers that are going to have to pay for the accident? Um, and if the manufacturers are going to be responsible, are they going to be wanting to release these vehicles? So um, what happens in a situation if you've got an autonomous vehicle that's an accident with, a, with another vehicle that is manually controlled? Is it the, the uh, manual controlled vehicle's driver that's going to be responsible? So all these type of questions are, are ones that have to be considered. All right, so um, another project we've been looking into is satellite and um, rubble tracking systems. And um, so there's a different aspects to it. Essentially, we, we're trying to um, continue with research that um, an elderly gentleman in Cape Town is, is working on. Um, his name is Greg Roberts. And um, the, yeah, so what's quite um, useful about this is that if there's any rubble orbiting the Earth and it should crash into, into a um, satellite, there's a lot of damage. And if you're able to track all these objects and be able to predict if there's any collisions that are going to happen, it's um, quite useful, especially for the companies that own the satellites. Um, I guess there's... Yeah, so we, we, we're trying to do it with visually and um, as well as with radio transmission. There are a couple of countries um, that are not very happy, you know, if you're able to track their spy satellites. And um, so we're not interested in terms of what they're communicating with and, you know, what their signals are. But what is also quite useful is um, you get a lot of free-to-air television signals being transmitted from these satellites. And so um, you could watch TV on one satellite change it and watch TV on another satellite. Same time, we're also trying to use this project for tracking our UAVs. So um, if we can focus a beam of communication, it's going to be a narrow beam, which means there's extended distance of communication with the UAV. And um, it's quite critical because of that narrow beam. You, if you're a little bit off, you are, have lost complete communication with the uh, UAV. So some of the improvements um, that we're looking at is, or oh, that's also, you know, um, things that need to be looked at, is decreasing the weight of the platform, um, decreasing the platform cost. Is it worthwhile to have um, a robot that is, has got all this equipment on, on it and it's costing 50,000 francs? Um, and if something happens to it, you've lost that robot. Or is it better to have a few cheaper robots um, the functionality might be less, but if you lose it, oh well, it's not the end of the world. Uh, maybe there's a need for hybrid platforms, ones that's able to fly, ones that are able to maybe go on the ground. Um, smaller units and platforms means smaller devices, less power, um, and obviously, you know, you can increase communication with breadcrumb transceivers and also have a small network of, of um, sensors and and features. So um, maybe 3D printed platforms are relatively cheap and might be a solution. And also overlaying your thermal and normal video could be quite useful as well to be able to um, get the best of both worlds. All right, so coming to the second part of my presentation, which is the other research area. Don't worry, I don't, not each um, section is, is as long. So it's, um, the last two sections are a bit shorter. Um, so the other unit that I'm, I'm adding is a bioengineering unit. And um, this is in terms of biomechatronics. So if you have a look at the figure at the top over there, biomechatronics is the integration of your biology, computer, mechanical, and electronic engineering um, aspects. We're trying to do research that, research that is biologically inspired. And um, the reason for that is, is if you look at the way that nature has been developed um, and designed, it's actually quite phenomenal. And um, 
It might be just because of my personal beliefs so, though, but I think it's the optimal design that has been made. If you look at it in terms of dimensions, if you look at what the um, power output is obtained, and therefore I think it's, uh, it's critical that we could learn something from this. So we're trying to, um, well, to give you just an example, um, if you look at a cockroach, if you go and chop off its head or break off a leg, it's still able to, to continue running. Don't worry, it's not something I do in my spare time. It's just, you know, something I've observed. Um, so we're trying to assist people with um, tele-operating devices, um, prosthetic devices. We're looking at neurological ana analysis and improvements. Um, exoskeleton, obviously it gives strength, rehabilitation purposes that it's got, um, some motion control aspect to it. Um, we're looking at biological motion analysis, um, kinematic analysis, and then sports sciences have even approached us and asked us to help to see how certain athletes are able to improve on their skills using some robotic platform to, you know, to help with their training um, approach. So um, if you're aware of the Festo, um, bio-inspired robotic systems like the elephant trunk. Um, it's quite a unique um, trunk that's able to manipulate itself and pick up objects. And um, Festo also built a, a bird. So we thought, oh, you know what, it would be really nice to also try out this bird and see what, how it performs. So we built our own bird. Um, you'll see in a tail, it's able to move up and down. And this obviously you know, uh, that with the head is able to move left and right, gives you different degrees of free freedom of motion. And so we also had to look at exoskeleton devices. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, the students, um, when I told him, you know, I want him to build an exoskeleton device and, um, you know, try to sort of give them some information about it, they didn't really grasp the concept until I told them that, I want them to build an Iron Man suit, and they were all happy and, and you know, they accepted the challenge. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so with this exoskeleton arm, it's a six degree of freedom um, arm, and um, it's, uh, the, the focus over there was to, for rehabilitation, of, you know, for strokes, stroke victims, and um, the, the idea was to have it low cost, especially for in South Africa, we've got, you know, where there's not much funding available, as well as to make it compact. Um, so we wanted to fold this all up and put it into a bag that you're able to carry with, your, with you, put it into the back of your vehicle, go off to a rural area where there's limited facilities and be able to help people over there. We also um, had a look at this exoskeleton leg system, also for rehabilitation of, of the legs. And then we had to look at um, EEG headset control. Now, I don't know how many of you um, are familiar with EEG headsets. It's not as straightforward as what everybody might think. Um, it's quite an interesting system. Um, so what I did is I put on this headset, got into my car, and I drove around the city where I live. I think I might have almost caused a few accidents with people looking at me and seeing this contraption on my head and them not focusing on the road though. But um, what was really interesting is that, you know, you, you, well, I'm one of those people I try to be calm when I'm driving, but when you have an old lady that swerves in front of your vehicle, even though you are, you are supposed to be calm, it's, it's um, amazing to see these spikes going up and down. And um, yeah, so what's happening in your mind is not necessarily shown in, you know, in, in your actions. Problem with this headset is that it's got limited electrodes. So it is diffi more difficult to extract information compared to other EEG headsets. The reason we used it is because of its, its cost. We were able to afford this and we're not able to afford one of those fancy type of EEG headsets. Uh, so we also had to look at the chaos control of the sacrital 
um, bipede con um, control system. Yeah, chaos control, that is something at a completely different level um, and very complex to, to, to get a control system going. We also had to look at um, modular prosthetic legs. And um, the reason for that is that on the news we were told that um, there's this 10 year old kid that needs a prosthetic leg and they are requesting for funds from the public for this leg. Anyway, um, they were able to get funding and the kid got a leg and six months down the line, there's another request on TV. Oh, we need a, a leg, please help us to, to fund us. Now, first thing that comes to mind is, you know, as this kid may be use this leg for other purposes than walking. You know, why is it that they need a new leg? That they maybe not look after it and damage it. Anyway, so after some investigation, it came down to that this kid actually grew within six months. And because of that growth, it um, caused that the prosthetic leg was, was outgrown and was too small for that, for that kid. So what we did is we looked at adjustable modular prosthetic legs. Um, so we looked at a pure mechanical knee joint that we could use um, for people that would like just to have a mechanical knee joint. But if they're saving up money and they would like a more robotic type of knee joint, they're able to upgrade to that. Um, we looked at adjusting the, um, the foot. So as a person would go and get bigger shoes, they'll be able to just adjust their foot and also have any spylons that we're able to extend and um, make the leg longer. So we also had Eastern La Chapelle um, visiting us um, and yeah the reason why I'm, I've just put him over here even though it's not research that we've done is that um, with well, he's probably in the pop, uh, I think he's probably in about standard eight at the moment and um, he was being built in his prosthetic arms. And um, even though it's not necessary to say that it is top technology that he's been doing, what he's been able to do at that age has been quite a lot of motive, uh, or has given quite a lot of motivation to our students. All right, so when um, Eason came to visit us, we were actually busy with this project, the Touch Hand. And, um, so John Harris, who is um, our guinea pig to test out our prosthetic devices, um, he helped the kid to get down his cut from, from um, cables that were extended across the road. And well, he thought it was telephone wires and it ended up being 33,000 volts electrical um, wires. So he lost his arms and this is a prosthetic device that he is usually um, using. And we looked at uh, using air muscles for control, control of the um, top part of the arm. And then we focused a lot on the, more on the hand that would be able to fit on him and that we'll be able to test it out to um, see the performance of it. Um, so just like some media coverage we got when he actually tested it out. Um, Ingenuity celebrated at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, applying the principles of science and maths to develop low-cost solutions to technical problems. This mechanized prosthetic arm, a case in point. John Harris was electrocuted 17 years ago. He's now a below elbow amputee. Yeah, just being able to be self-sufficient and independent. Definite step in that direction. So how does it work? It's picking up the muscle. When your muscle flexes, it gives off a slight uh, pulse or electricity. And the sensors you see on the hand pick it up. And uh, the computer, the software that we wrote, uh, realizes, OK, you're trying to tell me something. What do I do? And then it does it. It's very cost effective. But our aim is to make it accessible for people who can't afford the quarter of a million rand and the, mo the most advanced prosthetics. So this is what we're trying to push. And we've managed to get it within our budget of 8,000 rand. The automated bricklaying machine sparked interest. What we expect to do is increase the skill of the workforce of South Africa. So instead of them actually going and doing the hard physical labor and toiling, all they have to do now 
is supervise this machine, provide the correct inspection techniques, make sure the machine is running correctly. The spotlight then shone on this solar-powered car. It will now be modified to improve its efficiency. With the new design, our top speed will improve from 95 kilometers an hour to 120 kilometers an hour. Our aerodynamic drag should decrease. Um, this one here had a very high um, drag coefficient, whereas our new vehicle is, is competitively low. First-class designs for an ever-evolving sector. Blaine Herman, SABC News, Durban. They um, asked us, well, what, we, what, what they want us to do is, is to start off this um, company um, and to try and sort of develop more devices that will be ideal for the Africa scenario. So this would be typical for, um, with the war situations happening in Africa, and all the, you know, people are losing limbs, it could be even landmines that are, are there, and this is quite, quite critical and important. So um, we actually um, said, okay, we'll start off this company, and we using it as an avenue to, to try and obtain funding from other sources no, than your normal academic um, funding um, opportunities. All right, so um, that was a more recent video. Um, yeah, as you, if you had to compare that with the previous videos that you might have seen me in the previous videos, I had still a bit of hair and less stress and until, you know, maybe it's more students that are causing me to stress more. Um, so, that's like one of the more recent projects that we're involved with, but there's obviously some improvements and, and you know, more work that we can, can do on this. And it does include like EEG or EMG signal interpretation and connectivity methods. Um, we tie, we've, we've got sensors in the, in the hand, um, temperature sensors, vibration sensors and um, similar ones. And, you know, we've been using vibration as, as feedback to the user. And um, it's not the ideal way to communicate with the user. Um, I think it would be more ideally if, if we could u communicate with the neural or nervous system. Um, but I think there's some ethical clearance, especially for us, that you know, we would have to first be able to get past. We're looking at a low-cost um, system that is more affordable for the low middle-income um, person. So, yeah, I get asked, well, what is considered affordable? And this would be, well, we, we're trying to, to say, okay, well, the first hand we were able to make worth about 800 euros. We want to try and make a more advanced one and try and keep the cost below about 3,000 euros. So I'm, I'm saying euros, um, it's probably about the same as your um, Swiss franc value. So that is um, sort of what I'm, I'm referring to. Um, the thing is, in Africa, there's a lot of people that probably get gets one euro a day um, to survive on, which is not much. Um, there's other people that might, um, you know, um, begin probably about up to five five euros. So either way, it's not it's not something that they'll be able to afford. So we want to try and look into a sponsorship program later on that we could then once we've performed the research and expanded on it and still continue with the research um, and advancing things, it would be at least some purpose that we can have um, from, from this research. It's um, quite critical to, you know, like for, 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 for us, it's critical to do research that's going to be changing people's lives. And um, I guess this gives purpose to, to students who, and give them motivation to do the research. And, um, you know, if you don't do, if you're doing research and there's no purpose to it and it's just all theoretical and you can't apply it, um, I'm sort of wondering, you know, isn't it maybe a waste of time? Um, oh, it's great to have models and simulations and stuff, but if you're not able to apply it, um, what's the purpose of it? All right, so some of the, the problems that we are experiencing in South Africa at a national level and I believe these are problems that are experienced at the international level, even over here. Um, <clears throat> firstly, researchers are specialising in a very small area, and that could be. Oh, I, I must say, I need to go. Sure. So, but you have my computer. Okay. I'm so, wondering, so, do you have a long time? I've got probably about ten minutes that I need to. 
Sure. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, yeah, so we, we you know, the, the, you, you specialize in robotics, but if you look at like the agriculture sector, you can't go and, um, you know, have all the knowledge of the agriculture sector. So, you know, you might have a robot that's doing harvesting, but there might be a specific way to harvest the land. There might be some legal requirements, um, protocols and standards and best ways to do it. We don't know what it is if you're not an ag agriculture engineer. There's no or little collaboration happening. And um, what's happening is this reinvention of the wheel. You, you know, you're busy doing one specific project over here. We're doing exactly the same type of project in South Africa. The US is doing the same project. And so everybody's research is sort of at the same level. Um, and there's sometimes a, a competition happening type of thing. Um, I was in Magdeburg in Germany with the Rover Cup um, competitions. It was really great to see what different universities and institutions are doing. And this does motivate students. Um, and I think the main reason for, for this collaboration not happening is there's this issue of who does the intellectual property belong to. Um, well, for us, it's costing about 50,000 euros equivalent for, for patents. And you've got to renew it um, yearly. It restricts you in your publication. So why are you waiting for that patent to be processed? Somebody else might be publishing some um, similar work. And um, you start asking the question, isn't public domain or open source research more worthwhile? There's some jealousy between researchers. So these are actually comments I've received um, in reviews. And obviously you start realizing, well, maybe you know, a person has been performing research in a specific area for quite a few years um, and had this problem. It's not looking good on them if somebody else is solving their problem. So there's limited support and criticism um, for, for reviewing of papers and examinations of MSCs and PhDs. Um, and is it justifiable to say that the research is useless? You've got different levels of research happening. The US might have DARPA funding available, um, and it's obviously much more easier to perform research, while other places might not have. Um, also, if the research is not in the public domain, it is actually still new, um, or it could be considered new research. There's different levels of research. So what I believe is that we in South Africa have got a very similar research level than here in Europe. Um, and in Switzerland, and we're finding that other institutions in other countries might have lower standards. Um, you know, things that assignments I would give probably to our second year students would be considered as PhD research at some institutions. I'm not saying we should lower our standard. I'm saying if we're looking at a big project, instead of one person trying to optimize a whole bunch of small aspects, Maybe it's better to split up that project into smaller, um, um, smaller projects and let each person do a full optimization of each of those, of those um, sections. So we're pursuing to complete the MSc in one year, a PhD in two years. I've been able to achieve that. Um, with that, we do about one ISI journal at least for, for the MSc um, with possibly a conference paper. Um, PhD is about three journal, journal papers with about three conference papers that we um, get then done during that time. Job creation is important in South Africa especially. And this is what, what with this possibility has been quite a, quite a nice thing. It's, you know, we encourage the students that if they can continue with their research and, and go on, at least it's, it's maybe a business opportunity and um, it's another avenue for, for funding. What we find is that students often think, oh, you know, universities give us a, give a uh, unlimited su supply of funding, which is not the case. And um, so they're becoming more in the real world of, of what's happening. So the, the purpose of my, of my um, visit here is what's the solution? And this is with this robotics center in South Africa that I've been assigned to, to start. Essentially, it's incorporating these problems to have a network of support. Um, you know, if you're needing to, um, I believe some of your colleagues are having a competition for rehabilitation um, devices. 
and they said to me a couple of days ago, it would be really nice to have known we, doing, you know, we are doing this research in South Africa. Um, so if we've got some network, there's a communication distribution that can happen. There's um, some support with examinations, with reviewing of papers. We know in what the other person's facilities and their, their situations are, and we can support them in that way. Um, staff postcards exchange programs. So um, I believe you probably need about 100,000 um, Swiss francs for a PhD program. You probably need about between a third to a quarter of that to be able to survive very comfortably in South Africa. And um, so this might be an avenue to be able to have three people sent off to South Africa um, to do research. And I believe a lot of people over here want to go visit other countries and, and do their research here. Sharing of resources. Um, I find often, well, with us, you apply for funding, you get the letter of approval in January, comes to about September in the year, and you only get the funding. But you've got to use that funding by November before you can get the next application um, process. So we've got a long, uh, large portion of the year with no funding, and then a short portion with almost excess funding. But there might be maybe yourself that's looking for, for similar equipment on a project we're collaborating with, and it could be worthwhile so okay, well, we're able to assist with each other and vice versa. Um, and also, I think the main focus is to help um, different levels of um, researchers to boost their research profiles. I mean, especially if you're a young researcher, you've got a situation like a chicken egg scenario. You need funding to do research, but to be able to um, apply for funding, you need to have done research. So it's that type of scenario. All right, so these are my contact details and um, we can see all the research we've done. I think the, the main focus of, the, of, of, of this um, thing is to get some collaboration happening. Um, and I know it's difficult with, with projects. You know, we, 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 especially in, in, in the academic sector, you are so busy. You don't have time for new projects. But there might be similar research areas that we could look at. And it could be like we're co-supervising, co-authoring on papers that we've got similar interests in. And, um, you know, the person's co-supervising in another country, they can maybe review the papers, review your, your, your um, dissertations and, and theses, see if, you know, just to get an external point of view on what's happening. Um, they might be able to gain something as well in terms of the results, might be able to give some input. And um, in this way, everybody is benefiting. Um, so this is something that at this, this robotic center has been supported by the um, Swiss Embassy. Our president of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers who is the IEEE section in South Africa, and even our government officials. So this is something that they really would like to, us to, to, to pursue and get going. And um, we are really hoping that this will be achieved. Um, I'm the guinea pig for this. So if they see things are working well, they're going to pursue to um, get more researchers involved and um, hopefully get a team to come and visit Switzerland in a couple of months' time. Okay, so that's my email address. If you need to contact me, um, please do, you know, do so and um, I'll get back to you. And um, yeah, I'll be happy to answer any further questions you might have um, because I know you need to, you need to go. Great, thank you very much.